Would you like some tea? My team can make you some tea if you'd like some tea. I would love some loose leaf tea in a metal cup. <laughs> why, why don't you want this this tea? What you're doing here is is tapping into my. Sometimes my friends don't want to talk to me because I'm like the bearer of bad news. You know where it's like, what am I? What is Rhonda going to tell me now that I shouldn't <laughs> be doing that I love doing? Right. Another obsession of mine of late has been microplastic exposure. And I know you've talked about this on the podcast before, and it's it's in it's in the news now. A lot of people are sort of familiar with microplastics, right? Breakdown of plastic particles that are tiny, uh, depending on the size, and getting into our circulation, right? Mm -hmm. And when you think of microplastics, you think of plastic. When you think of plastic, you think, oh, that plastic water bottle. Yeah, well, I'll just avoid that plastic water bottle, right? What you don't realize is that everything, everything has plastic. So you have here this to-go coffee cup, which I don't know how many coffees I had and teas I've had in a to-go coffee cup, but it's hundreds, hundreds and hundreds. And the thing that's so disturbing is I learned that, you know, these pl many, most all of these plastic, I mean, sorry, these um, paper looking coffee cups are actually lined with plastic. They're lined with a plastic liner to prevent, like, the liquid to, you know, leaching into the paper, right? And that plastic lining, when you add heat to it, i.e. boiling water for tea or hot coffee, it accelerates the breakdown of the plastic lining. So you're drinking microplastic beverages and also the chemicals associated with them. So there was this classic study that was done that showed heating up plastic essentially causes these these toxic, you know, plastic-associated chemicals like BPA, bisphenol A, which is an endocrine disruptor. It disrupts hormones. It sort of mimic, mimics estrogen. So, you know, it's, it, it's sometimes like called an estrogen mimetic. It causes that to leach into your beverage 55 times more. 55 it, times? 55-fold, yes. Which is 5,500%. It's a lot, yes. And so you're talking about drinking, you know, plastic chemicals and microplastics. So that was like, okay, well, fine. I'm going to bring my mug in anytime I'm traveling and ask them to put my coffee in that. So I, I see so many people with these, these to-go, you know, paper cups and, and, and they're drinking coffee in it. And it's like, it's so hard for me because I realize it's like this plastic soup that you're drinking. Now you have a tea bag on top of that. And that is something that there've been over the course of the last seven or eight years, there have been studies that have come out that these, these tea bags are composed of, made of, you know, there's plastic polymers in them. And so there's thousands of microplastics that are released in every milliliter of tea from these tea bags. And there's a variety of different tea bags. Essentially, all of them release microplastics. The ones that's, that, that look like they won't release them. So now, while I used to drink a lot of tea when I'm on the go, I, ha I bring my own with me. I bring my own loose leaf tea with a little, you know, one of those little steepers that can steep the tea. And I use that because, mostly because the heat, you know, it's just, it's accelerating that breakdown. Yes, I'll drink plastic, I mean, I'll drink water out of a plastic bottle sometimes when I'm traveling because there's no other options. And actually there was a study that just came out, I'm sure you saw it. Did you see the study that showed glass had higher levels. So water that was in glass had higher levels of microplastic than water that was in plastic containers. This was a study that came out of France. Oh, come on. You didn't see the study? No. Oh my gosh. This no, is like everywhere, it. everywhere. I mean, it came out, I don't know, in the last two weeks or so. Um, the study came out of France and it was essentially showing that glass bottles had more microplastics in the liquid that they contained than plastic bottles, which contain liquid. And you might go, what? That makes no sense, right? I mean, why would the glass have plastic particles at a higher level than a plastic bottle? Well, it turns out that the paint on top of the lid of the glass bottle has, is, it has plastic polymers in it. And so the paint is flaking off and getting into the water that is contained in the glass bottle. There is, I think, a silver lining here, and that is, well, okay, there might be more microplastics in the beverages that are in the glass bottle compared to the plastic bottle, but the size matters. So it was shown that the size is larger 
in the glass bottles compared to the plastic bottles. And the, the size of the plastic. The, pl the size of the microplastic. And there's a reason why this is important because microplastics and nanoplastics, as you get smaller in size, they get smaller, they're called nanoplastics. Those are the most dangerous because it can be more easily absorbed in the gut and get into the circulation. If it gets into circulation, it can more easily bypass the blood-brain barrier and get into the brain. Size matters. And so the larger size flaking off from the paint is less likely to be absorbed by the gut and to get into circulation. Now, this has to be shown. I'm sure that's gonna, the study is gonna be done next. Like this is gonna be the next study. It hasn't been shown yet. I've heard you talk about fiber as well playing a role in getting microplastics out of our body. Okay, so yes, yeah, so fiber is interesting. This all comes from animal studies. And fiber seems to play a role in the absorption of microplastics and nanoplastics in your gut cells. And that's really important because if you don't absorb them, it's excreted through feces, right? And it's been shown we only absorb about one to 2% of these microplastics that we're ingesting. Fiber, what it does is two things. One, it moves the microplastics through the intestines quicker, right? Which is what fiber does. But I think the more important thing is the type of fiber. So you want this fermentable type of fiber, soluble fiber. That's the kind of fiber that's really good for your gut microbiome. And what that does is it's essentially creating this viscous gel-like, sort of gel-like, you know, mucousy stuff inside of your gut that encapsulates the microplastics so that it can't be absorbed by the gut, you know, what are called mm -hmm. the gut epithelial cells. And so if you're essentially not able to absorb those microplastics, then they're not getting into circulation. And that's like the biggest thing that you can do, right, is, is not get them into circulation. Now, this is all based on animal evidence. I did speak with, with a, a microplastics researcher at a Harvard, Dr. Um, Carrie Nadal, and she wasn't even aware of this. And now she's like on it. So I'm hoping that there'll be some human, human evidence coming soon looking at whether or not microplastics if you're eating fiber, if that can basically blunt the absorption of the microplastics into the system. I think people that are eating more fiber in their diet probably are getting less of that microplastics into their into their system, but that hasn't been shown in humans. It's only been shown in animals. I'm guessing you don't eat canned soup either. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So the canned soup is interesting. You know, again, aluminum cans are lined with this plastic, you know, lining. And that prevents the, the sort of breakdown of the, uh, of the, the aluminum, right, the metal. Uh, unfortunately, it also causes these chemicals like BPA that are in the plastic lining to leach into the, in this case, the soup or the beverage or the liquid that they're contained in, right? There was a study that showed, I think it was, was it a thousand percent increase of BPA after drinking like soup out of a can versus a soup out of a glass. A thousand percent increase in bisphenol A levels. I mean, that is- Bisphenol A levels being- BPA. Which is that bad thing in microplastics. It's the, it's one of the bad chemicals in plastics that is an endocrine disruptor. So it's disrupting hormones. And, you know, that can play a role in a lot of different things, um, depending on what we're looking at. So it's hugely important for obviously like neurodevelopment in children, so like pregnant women, but even like, you know, disrupting disrupting hormones in general, like mimicking estrogen. I mean, that's not something that guys want to do either, right? So it does, it is something to be aware of. But the thing is, is that, you know, BPA, it was this beautiful marketing strategy that came out, I don't know how many years ago, but all this BPA was replaced with something else that wasn't BPA, it was BPS. And so now everything is marketed as BPA free. And people think that is like, oh, oh, it's not dangerous, it's BPA free. However, what it's replaced with is doing the same thing as BPA, if not worse, and that's been now shown in multiple studies. So it's also an endocrine disruptor. It's doing the same thing, and yet people think you know, that it's, it's safe because it's BPA free.